Make me not so large. How about that? Ah, I'm floating. Hey, everybody. How's it going? I'm having a crisp. Uh, hang on now. You think everything's set and then, and then it's not. Hang on, hang on, I don't know. Um, I mean, I don't want to be too big because I want you to see all this. Look at this wonderful stuff. Look at, look, I'm going to, I'm going to, let me just lean, lean over. Uh, oh, wait, no, I did this. Look at those little cows. Oh, I can't wait to show you this whole quilt. It's so great. Oh, that's really smooth. Hey, well, wait, hold on. I'm going the wrong way. What's up? <laughs> um, oh, I didn't do it right. Okay. <sighs> anyway, hello. Let me make sure that you can hear me. Hi. Well, heck. The gang's all here. It's like we, yeah, I mean, I feel like we were just here. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you for last night. I feel like... I don't know, last night was really fun. It was so much fun. And and we're back. And we're back. And that's and that's great because tonight I have I have more great stuff for you. Last night, you know, if it was your first night here on this uh program, on this wacky program, uh, you know, it was a different thing. We 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 did a lot of chatting. I mean we <laughs> we we chatted it up. Um we also I mean eventually <laughs> about an hour later, but after the show began, we, we read Quilter's newsletter and it was amazing. I loved it so much. Friday nights, every other week, are Quilter's newsletter nights. We just see what happens, you know? And I have to make myself not do as much prep for that show as other shows because it should be looser. It should be like, like this. Uh, and that's how it was. But it was great, it was great. Uh, so, so the other shows that we do three times a week are a little bit more like tonight's show. Sometimes we go for hours and hours and hours. Tonight, we probably won't go that long. I mean, we won't go as long because uh, I'm a little bit tired because guess what I did? Let me say hi to people. Let, Susan, My Susan R. Michael. <clears throat> I mean, I know I can just call you Susan Michael, but to me, you're Susan R. Michael. And you're the first name I saw in the chat. And I'm really glad you're here. You are a special person. Okay. Uh, Sonia is here. What's up, Sonia? Uh, yeah, it, sometimes it says like the number of viewers and it's not true. Sometimes it has to catch up. And then sometimes it says zero when there's 5,000. We haven't hit 5,000. I think we'll all know when we hit 5,000, but you know what? It reminds me to, well, to mention, I'll get to it. Look at that. You see that highlighted thing? Oh no, you can't because the green screen doesn't like the highlighter. It says giveaway on my quilt nerd content plan, that thing that you can't see, it's a highlighted thing that says giveaway. And by highlighted thing, I mean it's my handwriting with highlighter on it. That's right, we're doing a giveaway. I'll tell you all about it. It's coming up soon, soon. Uh, hey, Bonnie, you're here, you made it. I'm so glad you're here, Bonnie Kane. Uh, like sugar cane, you're sweet, you're sweet. Uh, little bird stitch, God bless you, Mark. Mark, you get to watch it live again. You know, my favorite live streamer, she uh, she goes live every day of the week. Like, in the morning, I mean, pretty early. She's got kids, and they're pretty young. I mean, they're, they need to get off to school. And so, I mean, she, she's, she goes live every day at, like, 8 a.m. I'm there every time, unless I can't make it, and then I listen to the replay. By the way, that's an announcement that I can check off my content plan. For a while, I was live streaming, I was multi-streaming this show to Twitch um, and YouTube. And I'll just keep, I'll say this a few, you know, for a little bit longer, um, and then I won't say it anymore. But um, as of, I mean, I think it was last week, maybe the week before, um, I, we, the royal us, uh, really recognized, I mean, I, I did recognize that it's, it's best to just be on one network Right, because your favorite shows on one on one network, Netflix Netflix ain't Sharon. I mean, not <laughs> Sharon. All the Sharons are like, excuse me. Um, Netflix is not sharing content, at least not right away. Right. So so this show is live on Twitch. Uh, it's what it's built for. Uh, the show is built for Twitch. Twitch is built for live streaming. Have faith in me. I know what I'm doing. I swear. And one day quilters will take over Twitch, and then, and then won't we feel smug? Um, but, uh, but all of the shows will always be on YouTube. So after the show is done, I will upload the show to YouTube. And the thing is, is that that's what, that's really great because, because Twitch, 
the video on demand, um, the, re the reruns, the replays, they do live on this channel, my Twitch channel, but they only last for 60 days, 60 days. Well, this content <laughs> and the chat, I mean, it's timeless. So let's not let that happen. Let's not let this content, you know, go away into the ether after 60 days. So it's kind of a perfect thing that the show is live on Twitch, but if you can't make it, you can always go to my YouTube channel, uh, Mary Fonz, YouTube. I hope you subscribe and like. It's important these days to, to do that. If you, if you don't subscribe, you know, and, and like and stuff, it's crazy how much it matters. So if you if you don't follow me on Instagram, yo, Mary Fonz, yo, Mary Fonz. And here on Twitch, you know, click that that button, smash that like button, do all that stuff, because it, it really, it really matters. It's, I hate that it does those little things, but they matter. So, uh, so anyway, so that's the scoop. So I hope you're here. I hope you're live. Some people who are watching on YouTube are like, I was afraid of Twitch, but now I'm very good at it. And I'm like, I knew you would be. So, so don't be afraid. And there's going to be a giveaway and that's only for Twitch subscribers. So we'll get to that in a second. It's really good. It's really good. Um, Jill Alex. Hey, my peeps. Hello. Mark Wesley. Yeah, I said hi to you. Okay. Uh, Susan R. Michael and Padma. Hello. Hello. Sometimes I forget who I've said hello to, Bip. Bip, whose name is Bib. Bib Palumbo, but I just say Bib. Like Bip Bop. Um, excuse me. I've been drinking a lot of Topo Chico. <clears throat> it's the best water. I don't know if you know that, but it is the best. Um, hey, Sue, you love having something to do on Saturday night? Same. Same. <laughs> um, I love it that you're at the live, Sonia. I'm saying hi to like everyone and responding to every comment, which is maybe, I don't know. I mean, what? there are no guidelines. There's no rules. No one knows anything. Everybody pretends that they do, but no one does. The sooner you figure that out, the better off you'll be. Um, I have to tell you, I was pretty low energy before. As soon as the lights come on and the music goes off, it's like, we're here. I'm, I'm, I'm a stage, a stage dog stagehand i've trod the boards in my life the show must go on um word and Verdner says tonight you'd rather be here than watch football i saw some football talk in the chat what's going on here um is it football season yes it is super bowl super bowl oh is it the super bowl isn't that like in january perhaps i should re read the chat and figure it out um yeah this is great this is great this is great. Yeah, welcome, Baskets. Anytime somebody's new to the chat, um, another reason to watch the show on Twitch and be in the Twitch-verse. Um, we have special emotes, you know? And there's, like, welcome, Baskets. If you're new, everybody, like, throws welcome, Baskets at you. And then there's, like, a nerd apple for when we, we learn something very nerdy or someone has, like, a very astute comment. Like, someone the other day, who is it? Was it Shasta? Or somebody, like, defined like primitive art or naive art or something. It was like, oh my God. And she got the Nerd Apple Award. Who was it? So Hani B? I can't remember, but we also have a soundboard for these things. So if you do, if you like get the Nerd Award that night. It's not really an award, but anytime, I mean, we, we do, we have fancy things. Yep. It's Quilt Church. That's what this is. I haven't even said what the show's about yet. Yeah, I mean, there's a million things. Okay, so, I know, that's what you say about my soundboard, you say. Um, so, this show's about quilts, and that this should be apparent soon. That's a quilt behind me, by the way. Uh, oh, it's so good. Let me just do something a little bit crazy. Look at this, look at this. I know, we're gonna look at the whole thing, but look at this little, wait a minute. Look at, I know, I know, it's, look at that little guy. Look at him. I didn't know which, which, you know, what to like put behind me exactly because every part of the quilt is so amazing. But I need him now. Look at that little, that little scamp. Um, so we're gonna talk about that quilt. We always do. I have a different quilt behind me every night, every show, and we start there. You know, we start with the lows and all this stuff, but then we, then we start talking about quilts. And tonight is no different. Um, peace be with you, indeed. Look, I'm wearing my sweatpants again. Same sweatpants. I did take them off to go to sleep, but then I put them back on. Okay. Um, Molly Squared, your husband is real bummed out about the Titans. Oh, I feel like this is the Super Bowl time. Period of time. Um, 
who's winning? <laughs> well, now I feel too small. See, I'm biting the little bear. Okay, cool it, Fonz. Um, so what books will you be purchasing tonight, Jill? It's funny you say that. I mean, a couple. I think you might be buying a couple. eBay and Abe Books and Amazon, whatever. If you're watching, I would really like to be sponsored by you because we, I send viewers like almost every show, sometimes several times a show, to go and buy books used because a lot of the books that we quilt nerds love and need on our shelves <clears throat> are out of print. In fact, have I ever suggested a book that you buy that's in print? <laughs> um, actually, yes, unconventional and unexpected. The second edition of Rod Kirikoff's cult hit is uh, shipping now, I think, to people. So that's that's a really good book to use to, to get. But most of most of the books that I talk about are out of print, so we buy used books all the time. So pay up. I know I should do the affiliate link. Somebody said that, but I don't know. It just seems like a lot of work. Okay. Um, June Taylor. Okay, good. People are talking notions. I love this. Bridgewater <clears throat> in Virginia. Welcome. Miscellany. Miscellany is back. Great name. Great screen name. Uh, Word and Bird Nerd. Hello, hello. I had this moment where I thought I was on mute. I mean, I checked it. But what if it isn't true? I have to skip ahead. I'm very behind. I mean, I'm so far behind on hello. I mean, on the hellos. It's possible. No, no, I think I would see. Okay, no, it's fine. It's fine. Oh, God. All right. Um, <clears throat> so so I'm saying hi. Okay, who, who have I got here now? God, I hope I don't miss anybody. I've got Mark, Molly, Word and Bird Nerd, Padma. Okay, I, I think I've got, okay. Uh -huh. Teacher Stitch. I want to say Gal 59. Gal, my Gal. Gal, Gal 59. How about them Chiefs? I have no idea, but I'm sure they are great. Um... Yeah, okay, okay, I lost my place, but that's fine, that's fine. Everything's fine. Uh, Gal59 loves Honey Badger. Same, you're definitely in the place you need to be. Um, okay, Myra and Robin. Hey, Robin. Robin is here, Mother Nature is here. Wait, you met a nerd today in an online quilt class? Mother Nature? Who? Qua? Bring them here. I mean, tell them, tell them about how they need to be here, because they do. I mean, if you met a fellow nerd, if a body meets a body, if a body, what is it, catcher in the rye? If a body meets a body walking through the rye or something, if a nerd meets a nerd pawing through the fabric. Um, Holmes, what's up, Holmes? Holmes? I don't know, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy to be here. It's, it really is amazing how, how uh, the energy just sort of pumps up. Once I turn on the thing, crazy quilter, you loved last night, same. Sounds kind of, that's kind of intimate. I loved last night. So did I, but I did love last night. Um, <laughs> oh my God, why well, haven't told you people? Oh my God. Listen, I'm going to say this once, once, and I'm never going to say it again because it's, 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 it doesn't work, okay? It doesn't work. I'm not even gonna be like, I'm not gonna say like, this is terrible because it isn't terrible. It's cute and it's funny, but it's not, it's not a thing. And I don't want you to be like, it's not a thing, but we're gonna say it anyway. I mean, I don't know, I can't control you. But I was like, what? Cause, Cause a lot of times I refer to you all like as the nerds. Hey nerds, but like, I mean, the show's called Quilt Nerd, but like, I mean, I don't know, like sometimes I feel a little bit mean, like, see you nerd. So it came into my mind, not like, oh, this could be good, but it was like, what do I call a group of nerds? And I was like, the nerd herd. It's so awful. I mean, I would be a part of this herd, by the way, but like there's a lot of connotations to herd that's not good, but nerd herd is really funny, but we're not using it, so don't even try. If somebody tries, if people are like, haha, we're the nerd herd, I'll be like, I will not even acknowledge. But it is a funny, like, four letters, totally rhymes. It's, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, that's not good. The nerd, the nerdery, oh there, the nerdery. We can play with some things, but it's not gonna be nerd heard. Anyway, um, hey Dee Marie. So, Quilter Nerd, Quilt Nerd Deb, you made it, Woohoo! You did make it. 
The show's just getting started. Um, hey, a nun maker. Happy Saturday, Elaine. Is Elaine here? I don't know. I don't know yet. So and Karen. You love the farm animals? I mean, this quilt is perfect. It's a perfect quilt. Um, it's Saturday night in the quilt nerd world. There's nothing better. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Um, quirk quilts. Hey, Cheyenne. I uh, just threw a load in and ran down to my sewing room. Feels like I'm in a cozy room with familiar, friendly people. Y'all can't keep doing this, like, lovely stuff. I mean, it's really nice, you know? It's really nice. It's like, you know, turn on the turn on the mic and, and hit the... You know, there really is a button that says go live, you know? And I'm like... And then here we are. It's freaking awesome. How is 5Z in the chat? Mark is asking how 5Z is. I think, and that's my husband, um, who gave out five Prime subs last night, which was so cool. He gifted them, uh, which is amazing. Um, he's good. He's good. I think he may be asleep. He may be asleep, but, but we don't know. He might pop in and start gifting subscriptions. Um, Topo Chico, Molly understands. It's the best. You got to watch that Topo Chico. It'll spray everywhere. That's why it's so good. Um, you gotta go on the lamb. Ah, oh, Molly, you might not even have heard me say that we are, we are sisters. Fiendor, ah, good morning. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the, for the music, always. And the Super Bowl's on the 22nd. Okay, 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 okay. JSOC, JSOC, the sweatpants will be at QuillCon. Thank you for noting that that is my, that is my chosen outfit. I'm gonna wear sweatpants. These aren't the, but I'm gonna get new red sweatpants for QuillCon. And DH is here. DD Brew Crew is here. Okay, okay, okay. I think I've got everybody. Just do a fake Abe Books ad and find a way to insert no more yo-yo dieting. You got, you liked it, right? Wasn't it sweet? No more yo-yo dieting. I like the sound of your podcast, and I'll give it a try. I like the sound of your quilt nerd show on Twitch, and I'll give it a try. It's still Witherspoon. Oh my God. Okay, so that's an, that's the other announcement. And then I, I'm gonna get going. Hey, Sonia, Sonia, if I didn't say hi, I said hello. Um, Estelle Witherspoon is um, in the chat. <laughs> Estelle Witherspoon is our uh, moderator until we have other moderators and uh, human human moderators. And uh, there is a, there's a Harriet, the Harriet animal. That's good to see her. Um, Streamlabs, you know, has like a bot, and because we need a moderator to like keep trolls away, the Streamlab bot does that now, <laughs> and and it was called the Streamlabs bot when it was activated, but that's not very nice. And the Streamlabs bot is really intense, so if you put like a bunch of like hearts and love symbols in the chat to express your love, uh, the Streamlabs bot is like. Mm, I'm gonna time you out. And I have fixed some settings, but I haven't fixed all of them, I guess. But the best thing, the, the one thing I did fix is to name it something else. And it was a whole thing. It was like, I watched a like tutorial, believe me. But um, but I changed the name of the bot, at least, to Estelle, Estelle Witherspoon. And Estelle Witherspoon basically like ran the Freedom Quilting Bee in the 1960s. And she was, I mean, was there a, a uh, uh, I don't want to say a bigger badass, but like, was there like a more like, I don't know, uh, what do I want to say? Not not intimidating, but just like, I don't know. If if anybody's gonna be a moderator in a room, I'm gonna want it to be Estelle Witherspoon. So I named the bot Estelle Witherspoon. Um, <laughs> yeah, a sound effect for whoever gets caught by Estelle <laughs> the first time each episode. That's really good. Of course, we do have this. Estelle is on the case. Um, that's really good. That's really good. So um, let me just tell you real quick about the, the giveaway. So, and then we'll talk about this quilt. And I think, oh yeah, yeah, there's one more thing. Well, okay. So, so but this is good. I gotta, I gotta tell people about this. So, so, and many of you know about it, but if you're watching the replay and you haven't, uh, you know, ha seen the last couple shows, or maybe just the last show, is that one I announced? Or maybe a couple shows ago. Anyway, so a few, oh, I gotta get small. So, so for a few... Uh, a few of you, you know that um, we did a show on on um, Margaret Wood, or there was a, a chapter, a section, a section, a feature on Margaret Wood, who is this 
is she still around? Like, someone needs to find her. Let her know we were, we've been talking about her if she's still around. I think she is. Anyway, um, she was a fashion designer for a long time. And then she became a quilt maker. And she's just really fascinating and interesting. And one of the interviews that I read when I was like gathering content about her was by this woman who has this shop, right? And Margaret, this online shop. And she's like this young woman who has this shop. Anyway, so Margaret Wood is Native American. She's Navajo, Seminole heritage. And the woman who interviewed her, Turtle Island, I believe. Anyway. So this is Beyond Buckskin. This is the woman who interviewed Margaret Wood. This is her shop, her online shop. And it's a shop that Native American made honoring tradition going beyond the expected. So it's this online shop that supports independent designers by giving them a platform to sell their stuff. And I was just minding my own business and I happened upon this thing and I'm like, well, I love it. I love it all. I think it's great. I want the earrings, I want these earrings a lot. And I want, what else do I want? I want the moccasins. I need to see them again and covet them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want all of them. I really, I really do. But these little yellow ones, these are really great. Anyway, so instead of buying lots of things, <laughs> um, I, bought, I bought something else. I was like, oh, gift certificates, oh my God. So a hundred dollar gift certificate is going to be drawn to Beyond Buckskin and it's going to go to one lucky winner. Um, we're, we're almost at a hundred shows and that's the sort of occasion for this. Um, I should do more giveaways all the time. You know, we got to start somewhere in a hundred shows. Today, today is the 87th episode of Quilt Nerd. And, and so, so the hundredth show, um, I'll be live from QuiltCon. It's going to be intense, man. Uh, and I'm going to draw a winner. And to be uh, a winner, <laughs> you it's it, this is a giveaway for subscribers. And if you don't subscribe to the show already, it's $4.99 a month or $9.99 a month. Um, and uh, I've got stuff about the subscription. Anyway, for now, <laughs> it's $4.99 a month or $9.99 a month. And um, it's, it's extremely encouraging when people subscribe to the show. It's just like, I don't know. It just gives me a, some wind in my sails. And it also... You know, I get a new mic and then I get a light that's better and then I can hire somebody to like, you know, help me out to do some stuff so I can focus on content and someone else can focus on other things. I could talk about business more or we could just talk about a giveaway. If you uh, are a subscriber, you'll be entered into the giveaway and uh, and I'll draw a name and maybe it'll be you. And then you can have a hundred dollars for this very cool shop, which, you know, these things are not cheap because they're amazing. But it'll get you. It'll get you the earrings. I think the earrings were like ninety-four dollars or something. So you could totally score the earrings, um, or go partway toward. Where is my thing? Um, partway toward a pair of moccasins. Okay. So um, someone someone calculated it would be in February on the Saturday or Sunday that QuiltCon is ending. Okay, fabulous. That's. I still have to figure that out. I do. Um, oh. Oh my God, maybe the nerds who are at QuiltCon could be on the show with me. I mean, like, okay, okay, I, I'm not hesitating because I'm like, I don't want to say yes, but I should say yes. No, no, no. I'm just thinking like, yes. And as a person who has like produced, like, I'm just thinking, okay, let, let me put it this way. The first thought in my head is like, absolutely yes. The second thought in my head is the shot. Like, not the shot, not the tequila shot, which we'll also do at Quilcon, but 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 the um, like the camera shot. Like, how do we get everybody in the camera shot? Because I've, well, it's gonna sound like, uh, but but I've styled a lot of photo shoots, right? And the hardest the hardest shoots for quilt for quilt folk are the group shots because you have to get like weirdly close to each other. And and so and so I'm just thinking I'm just thinking that, that, that see see I can't have any fun. Because I'm always thinking about the technical stuff, but but it would be amazing. So 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 yes, and how do we do something like that? Because it'd be great. So let me just think about that. Let me think about that. Hey, Ivy Kadivy, Ivy Kadivy, it's great to see you. Um, but I love that. There's got to be a way. L Riggs, did you slip in here? Did you slip in here? I think you did. Um. So let me see. Let me see. So, so here's the quilt. I think I've got everything. Um, all day long, 
I worked on my fashion video all day long. It's really close now. It's like really close now. Um, and the last thing, and now we're here <clears throat> with the quilt, I'm going there now, is uh, I watched a video while I ate my lunch for five minutes. I watched uh, a video about, about YouTube, um, <laughs> about viewer retention and all this stuff. And I realized, you know, I've got all my YouTube videos uploaded, or all my um, Twitch shows uploaded to YouTube, but I have not, I, I never thought like, oh, I should clip out the whole starting soon screen on those uploads because that doesn't have to be there. I mean, if you're on YouTube and you click on something, it sucks that you'd have to either watch or, or speed through that like 10 minutes of, you know, Quilt Nerd will be on soon music and I can be in YouTube and snip that out. And in this video I watched today, they're like, most people jump out of a video within 30 seconds if they don't think that it's anything that they wanna watch. I was like, okay, well, <laughs> let's, let's cut that part out. And so I'm doing that and I'll be doing that now. So, so if you're watching this video for the first time on YouTube, you will have not have seen the thing that, yeah, anyway. Cause I think the viewer, the viewer counts should be higher on those. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll just do that and see what happens. Okay. So you'll meet up, you'll bring your mom. Molly, you're gonna bring your mom. <gasps> hey, Cotton and Bourbon. Cotton Bourbon? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What am I gonna play? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Everybody, Cotton and Bourbon. Audrey, it's Audrey. Wait a minute, wait a minute. It's your first time chat. Okay, okay, sorry, I'm excited. I'm excited to see you. I can't see you, I'm talking into the void. But I know you and um, I think that's who you are, isn't it? It's a first time chat. And you know what? No matter what, we got it. We got to send some welcome baskets to Cotton and Bourbon in the chat. And I'm really, really glad you're here. Um, and we should meet up at QuiltCon. There should be a meetup. Um, how do we do it? You know, how do we do it? How do we set it up? And that is something I would need help with for sure. Um, now Flinster, hello. Hello, hello. So, so, so I've been avoiding Discord because I'm behind. I've been like avoiding it like a neighbor you don't want to see because you borrowed like a cup of sugar and you're like, oh, shit. and they need sugar. Or something. <laughs> like they really need sugar and you're like, oh no, I took their last cup of sugar. I've been avoiding it because I've been editing and I'm just like, this. But, um, but we'll have to figure out something, obviously for QuiltCon, but what it is and how it's going to work is, is maybe going to need uh, some help, except that maybe we just say, let's all meet at Mary's hotel room and go out for a drink or something. I don't know, I don't know, but this is great. Um, okay, so you've done li you've done plenty for library conferences. <sighs> Molly, I feel like you're this resource that I need to tap for many things. <laughs> Be prepared. So I photocopied, I mean, I scanned in this quilt tonight, this intro quilt um, with, with, I mean, just great with relish, I did. Yeah, it, my scan is not the best because you can see, I, I kind of had on the, on the right hand side, I, I had a little bit of um, bend to the page uh, and actually my tab can be seen on the left hand side, but, but that's okay. Um, this quilt is in a book that I got after I was, it's out of print, um, but you can find it used. <laughs> Um, it's a it's a book that I got after being at the Quilt Museum for a board meeting years ago. So one of the cool things about being in the board, uh, on the board, I'm going to um, hide myself because I want you to see everything. Um, one of the things that's great about being on the board of the Quilt Museum is that let me just I'm gonna do this. Really? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. You can see even more of it. Um, you get to see the new acquisitions uh, in the collections room, which is very cool. I can go back. And um, they had this this quilt from, it was so weird. It was from the Miami, Miami Valley or something, wait a minute. Now I'm, I'm forgetting exactly, but it was like, it was, I heard Miami and I was like, Miami. <laughs> and it was this very cool quilt. And it was like, no, 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 Ohio. Yeah, don't they have like Miami University in, in Ohio or something? Anyway, so so I was like, oh, wow, it was a really great quilt. And I was like, what is going on with quilts of this of this place? 
you know, this Ohio Valley Western Reserve Ohio quilt. I, I had to know, Miami Valley, right? Something like that, sorry. So, so I was interested. So I started to investigate and I got this book, Quilts of the Ohio Western Reserve. I mean, look at that quilt. That could have been the cover quilt, but it wasn't. But look at, isn't that great? I shouldn't show you too much. I should use it for another time, but look at the little clothes on the line, you know? If you haven't noticed, if you just dropped by, this show is about quilts. I mean, we really talk about quilts here. That's, that's it. <laughs> we don't ta ever talk about anything else. No, we do. Um, we do, and that's the thing about quilts is they're really kind of about the whole world. So we just talk about the world, but quilts are the way we get there. Um, and so so I got this book, and, and it did not disappoint me. Um, this is about this, this quilt, okay? Um, the Stash of Nerds. Who said this? I missed it, right, when I said that collective term that we're not going to use the stash of nerds it's very good like a pod of whales a stash of nerds I see what you're doing I didn't even have to see it I get it you're very good okay here's what this is about and I'll zoom in here too at these wonderful details okay inspired by a re sorry this book is by Ricky Clark and and it's called quilts of the Ohio re Western Reserve and it was published by Ohio University Press. And Ricky Clark is an affiliate scholar associated with Oberlin College. Okay, Oberlin. Ohio's really got a lot going on, Ohio. It's pretty, pretty cool. Um, and Ricky Clark, who I've heard of but I need to know more about, is the author of several works on Ohio quilts, including as a co-author, Quilts in Community, Ohio Traditions. That's me pushing out my glasses, okay. Inspired by a round robin quilt one of its members had seen. <gasps> I love this quilt. You know what this quilt is? It's yummy. Look at that satin sun. The Huron Valley Quilt Guild decided to create its own. By the way, this quilt was made between 1994 and 2000. This round robin quilt, however, is entirely different. Most round robin quilts consist of a central pattern surrounded by a series of borders. The Huron Valley round robin quilt is similar to other round robin quilts, only in that it was designed and made by a number of individuals expressing the importance of the guild, the importance of the guild and its members. Can we please pause and see that this angel has a quilt block in their hand? Okay. And the man on the tractor, the farmer, is contemplating his life. I'm serious. There's just like a specific sort of way that he's turned. I love it. I know, El Riggs, same. I was like, well, this is from the 70s, right? Yeah. I know. I thought it's the same thing. Oh, look at that. Oh, there's so much. I haven't looked at this quilt this deeply, right? I mean, I haven't. So this is this is great. Look at the, the, the fabric. I mean, wait a minute. Where are those pumpkins? How did they get those pumpkins on there? That looks like it's the fabric, but is it? Is it? I mean, we're really close up, but I feel like we have to be. What is going on here? Who made these things? Look at this little fisherman. Look at the ducks. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Um, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit too so we can even see our life right now. Okay. It is nice, isn't it? Oh my God, Molly! I'm not even reading that out loud. <laughs> good one, good one. Um, okay. Because the Huron Valley Quilt Guild includes members from 17 different communities in four counties. Oh my God, really? That's a lot of people to make a successful quilt. I'm just saying. Recording their lives and thoughts as they worked on the quilt. Members were urged to share the sources of their fabrics, their reasons for choosing the fabrics. The, and their thoughts and feelings about the quilt. In this respect, the traveling quilt and journal are intensely personal. Each smaller group 
uh, kept the quilt for a month and shared its members' additions to the quilt and writings in the journal at monthly meetings. Oh my god. Who does this anymore? Sorry that edge is so bad. I apologize. Oh, is it a little football? <gasps> it's, a, it's a football player. That is a that is a football player. You tell me. You tell me there isn't something about this show. I know human beings find patterns. I know that's what we do. You know, sometimes it's like, you know, that's not a thing because you're just finding patterns. Your brain wants, but I mean, when have we talked about football on this show? When have we talked about it? We have never talked about it. When, and when have we seen a football player on a quilt? I'll wait. I'll wait. It's, it's this, it's this, it's this. And he's like weirdly in, in a haze because I screwed up the scan, okay? Okay, let's continue. The women began the traveling quilt. Uh, it's called the traveling quilt, okay, cool. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, Eleni, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Yeah, the bark texture, <gasps> it's true, Holmes. The bark texture is so is so good. It is so good. It's like, oh yeah, how good is it? Hey, Natalie. Natalie, we're basically just saying that this quilt is haunted by a very benevolent spirit. I mean, it's very weird. Um, I'm really glad you're here. Okay. The, the first motif of applique to the quilt was the large tree on the right-hand side. Um, there's nothing symmetrical about this quilt. It's a large scene with people, objects, and places appliqued to it. These include the VFW hall, you can see that now, uh, where the guild meets monthly, farms where various members live, a bakery, a three-dimensional little girl in a lovely dress. Yes, here she is down here. Look at that by all the little teddy bears. It must have been so fun to make a thousand percent. Hey, me, hey, hey, Amy, <laughs> hey, me, hey, me. Um, this is awesome. It's, it's good to see you. Um, a three-dimensional little girl and a baby on a swing. Where's the baby? Oh yeah, by the by the mysterious football player, Shirley Miller, an articulate woman. Articulate woman. Okay. <laughs> meaning she could move her limbs, who began working on the quilt in January 1994. Amy, one of the things that's surprising us about this quilt is that basically everyone thought it was made in the 70s, but it was started in 1994 and finished in 2000. Surely this articulate woman um, reported in the journal that they kept while they were making it that she used beige cotton in part because it, it looked like homespun. Oh, yeah which, quote, reminds me of warmth, tranquility, and a loving feeling. Homespun also implies the pioneer spirit of all quilts. Look at this little guy. Look at that little heart angel with a kite. The angel can't fly, has to use a kite. I like that. While the quilters were still working on the quilt, their guild president died. In her honor, guild member Rosemary Pocock, quote, decided to put her in the sky quilting on a cloud. Molly, how do you feel now? Feel good? Feel good about yourself? Do you feel like me? <laughs> I often say things. And then I read more and I learn things. Oh, God. Anyway, I love it. It's fine. It's my favorite thing ever. Okay. Um, there are now, okay, so, so, so Rosemary decided to put her in the sky uh, quilting on a cloud. I feel like she is our personal quilt angel. Okay, um, unquote. There are now three quilt angels on the quilt. For guild member Chris Michaels, appliqued two angels near the VFW building. Yep, our little kite people here. Um, to honor two other members who had died, quote, so their memory could be a part of our guild when we meet. We are the sum of the people we've met in our lives, she wrote. We should remember our former quilt guild members, whatever their wherever their paths have taken them. 
I mean, the only place we haven't really, you know, zoomed in on here is this lower left-hand corner. Um, Sunbonnet Sue on the swing. I know, it's amazing. It's amazing. Look, Fremont. What's a famous Fremont Street? Is that San Francisco? Seattle? One of those West Coast places. Um, I guess there's a cloud over that car because it's the commute to work. Um, the VFW Hall. Interested to know what that writing is. Not sure. Look, there's a fabric shop. Fabric shop. It's so delightful. Quilt show. There's a quilt show. This is amazing. I mean, it's, am it's just, it's an amazing, amazing quilt. What's down here? The pastry. That R is awful. <laughs> um, donuts. It's, it's wonderful. It's just wonderful. I mean, it's obviously our favorite quilt, right? Like, I mean, it's just, it's really, really good. It's got characters, the open sign, I know, the open sign. And, and again, I say unto thee, it doesn't have to be perfect. Creativity is so much more, so much more important than accuracy. <laughs> it just is. It's, and you know you've got a really fine, fine artist when they've got creativity and accuracy. And th these are the people that blow you away, you know, and they're like in art museums and stuff. I personally, accuracy, <laughs> are you kidding? No, but creativity, hell yeah. So I'm gonna lean into that, you know? And I mean, I wish I could make a quilt that looks like this, but it's really great. So the red puppy in my quilt agrees. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know what it agrees with. I missed that part, but I, I think it agrees with me. <laughs> yeah, Holmes who says, I love the scale or lack of. That is a huge tractor. Exactly. That's really interesting. I mean, it's like, it's almost as though someone was like, let's make the figures in the foreground slightly larger, you know, so it makes sense scale wise. And then someone was like, cool. I didn't get the memo. And then there's like, this guy who's like on top of the tree, you know? It's fantastic. It's just, it couldn't be more beautiful. I love it. What if your guild did this, you know? What if you did a pictorial quilt? Because the thing is, it reminds me of a, um, like a exquisite corpse game, you know, where you, you, you fold the paper up. I'm sure some of you have played this. You fold the paper up. Grandma Moses, totally. I get that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the collie dog. Oh my you fold the paper up and then one person like draws a feet, the feet and then they fold it over so you can't see the feet and then you draw the legs and then you fold it over and the next person draws the body. And, you know, it always ends up looking awesome. You know, this collective effort is really good. I mean, what if, what if you did a, a, a pictorial quilt like this? What if it was a canvas? It would be good. It just couldn't be not good, <laughs> you know? So that's what that's all about. It's hard to get everything in a landscape to be the same scale, totally. And I think, I think what's interesting about that, now that you've put it just like that, um, I have to say the quilts for sale barn down here, this looks like a bathroom at a park district. It looks like they're going to the bathroom at a park district, not to a quilt sale. So <laughs> I liked it until I saw that. Um, I'm really goofing off tonight. So. So, so, so I think, Bonnie, what you made me think about is like, you know, kids drawings, kids drawing. I mean, kids don't have a real good sense of perspective in drawing. That's something you learn, you know, you really, you learn it. And that's why kids, like all their drawings are flat. You know, it's like, this is my family, you know, and it's just all that. And then when they start to draw more and have some instruction, they can start to understand like, oh, you know, shading and all that stuff. And there's something so childlike about this quilt. And the scale is not, you know, accurate or whatever. And, and, it's, and so it has this wonder, this childlike wonder to it, I think, because of that. Um, I mean, that little bear with his yo-yo freaking balloons. I'm dead, I'm dead. I'm fully dead. Okay. So <laughs> Estelle has it out for Molly, I think. So here's what we're gonna do tonight. I told you, I told you the show was gonna be a, a slightly abbreviated. It's true. I mean, we're already an hour in, so it's not that abbreviated. I mean, if I came on here and was like, okay, people, here's what's going on. We're looking at one quilt and I'm out of here. That would be different. Um, but, but I've got, I've got a couple things for you tonight. And, and, and I, here's the theme. 
we're going to go way back, way back in time, and then we're going to come way forward in time. What we're going to do is we're going to look at one of the oldest quilts that's known ever at all. The Tristan quilt. The Tristan quilt. I mean, if you if if the if ye be a nerd of quilts, um, you gotta know your twist your Tristan quilt. I have bobby pins just in in my hair. Um, you gotta you gotta know about the Tristan quilt. So this this woman, I don't I well I do know who she is because I pulled up her her blog so I could tell you. Um, this woman is um, this is her from her it's it's from a blog called uh, Seams French S E A M S Seams French. What is her name? Uh, her name. This is from a, a, a post that she she posted to her blog Seams French in 2012, and the the subject was the art the Tristan quilt at the VNA. You know our our. So this woman took a trip to London. And she posted about this. I'm gonna visit her profile and see if I know her name, if I have her name here. I don't, I don't. But Seems French is her, her, um, her name. The reason that I have her here to start us off is because I have a really cool, oh yeah, oh yeah. Tristan. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Mom. Thank you. Thanks. We did it. Um, uh, the, we're going to look at the V&A website because remember when we did the Anne West coverlet and I was like, there aren't any really good detail shots of the coverlet. And then we went to the V&A site and they have an amazing functionality on their site where you can zoom almost microscopically in to items in their collections and, and, and look at them. So, so I did not pull down images from the internet to look at the Tristan quilt. We're going to use the VNA website to really look at this thing. Um, but what they don't have, I mean, I don't think I was really looking, they don't have a picture of the Tristan quilt as it's displayed. And this woman does, which I'm very grateful for. And I saw this myself at the VNA the very first time I was ever there. Um, it's right when you come in. I mean, if you've ever been to the VNA, and for my UK people, um, it's. I remember it being very, you know, I saw it. I saw it very soon upon entering the museum. Like I feel like it's like you take a right, and you know, like it's like down there, and there's a lot of stuff at the VNA. So, um, so I'm really grateful to this lady. I wish I knew your name, lady, but you're great, and maybe. Someone can tag her <laughs> and see if we can get to her. But this was from 2012, so it's 10 years ago. 10 years ago. She, doesn't she look lovely? She's like, I'm wearing my cool sandal. She reminds me of my mom a lot. So the Tristan quilt, okay? So now I've got another picture to come back to on that little piece. But, um, but for now, I just want to tell you from the Wikipedia entry, like the very broad view of all this is... Um, Hang on, okay. Uh, now I'm, oh, this is fun. Hang on now, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do this. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, hang on now, hang on, hang on. Here, here's the bird's eye view of the Tristan quilt, and then I'm gonna read to you from the VNA site, okay, as I go through these pictures. There's 30, 30 images of this, and we'll zoom in, and did I cry? I always cry. I cry all the time. I'm always crying, I cry like a tick. I just cry like this, like a tick. That's one of my favorite lines from my favorite movie of all time, Tootsie, Terry Gar. She's like, he's Dustin Hoffman's like, what, are you crying? Why are you crying? And she goes, I don't know. I just, I cry like this, like a tick. Um, so here's what the Tristan quilt is in, in a little nutshell. The Tristan quilt, sometimes called the Tristan and Isolde quilt. Isolde? Yeah. Or the... Giu Hold on. Giucchiardini quilt is one of the early, earliest surviving quilts in the world. Depicting scenes from the story of Tristan and Isolde, an influential romance and tragedy, it was made in Sicily during the second half of the 14th century. There are, <laughs> I, I think it's like a tick, like a tick, but it took me years to understand that she wasn't 
like talking about a clock or a tick. Yeah, okay. Um, there are at least two extant sections of the quilt. This is important. One of which is displayed at the Victoria and Albert Museum. So one of the at least two extant sections of the quilt. So there's sections of this thing. And one of them is displayed at the V&A in the medieval and Renaissance galleries. And the other section is in the Bargello in Florence. A third quilt also depicting Tristan and Isolde. Is it Isolde? I don't think so. It's Isolde, right? Isolde. Um, there's a third quilt also depicting T and I, but not thought to be part of the V&A and Bargello examples is held in private hands. Oh, ooh, la, la. The Tristan quilts are the only known surviving examples of medieval quilts. Is old, is old. Okay, Miss Eleni, that makes sense. Is old, Tristan and is old. I'm going with that. I'm going with that because I have no idea. Um, do they have seats at the VNA like they do at the National Gallery so you can just sit and stare? You know what? I think there is a seat there. I do. I do think that. I mean, maybe I'm just making it up, but. But I think I mean, because that's a yeah. I don't know. I don't know, but. I remember really spending some time with this thing. Look at this object, okay? Look at this object. Okay, now I'm gonna go to the VNA site. I have the same website pulled up on my little thing down here. And I'm gonna read to you what they say. Now, I will tell you that there are, you know, there's these 30 images. And I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot to this. Let me just start and we'll see how it goes, okay? Yeah, oh yeah, you'd totally cry, Riggs. Graduate school, nerd class tonight, a thousand percent. I mean, and then, and then just wait what we're gonna do after this. I was like, let's go real old and real new, okay? Contrast, contrast. Um, okay. The legend, this is the DNA now. The legend of Tristan in his old was a favored narrative in the Middle Ages and appears in many forms in literature and the decorative arts. The story represented here on a quilted linen coverlet in 14 scenes is that of the oppression of Cornwall, wow, by King Languis of Ireland and his champion, the Morold. M-O-R-O-L-D, the Morold, creepy. And the battle of Sir Tristan with the latter on behalf of his uncle, King Mark. Mark, 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 Mark. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's not that creepy that there'd be a Mark, but who knew there were Marks in the 14th century? I didn't. Although in subtle shades, the large scale designs, hang on, the large scale designs are very clear and the quilt must have looked particularly impressive by candlelight with lively scenes of battles, ships, and castles. Isolde, oh yeah. Yeah, okay, so maybe not Isolde or Isolde or Isolde, Isolde. Yeah, that really makes sense, Isolde. I like it, I like it. See, I'm impressionable, but Isolde does sound, does sound right, Isolde, Isolde. I don't know, I'll just change off. <laughs> Okay, so here, let's just keep going here on this. Wait, wait, wait. Yo, look at this. Look at this. Isn't it amazing? Look at this boat. I mean, y'all, it's, it's, it's dated at like second half of the 14th century. I mean, that's cray cray. It's cray cray. This thing is was made. I mean, how long ago was that? <laughs> it's a very long time ago. And I love their little faces, you know? They're just cartoons. They're like cartoon people. People just had faces, you know? They're no different than us. I mean, Really, people love and they fight and they look at the fish down here. Hang on. Can 
Can I, what am I doing here? Can I go in even more? I mean, they give such great detail shots, then, then I, I, I could probably just keep going and they'll give us a detail of the fish. I wonder how big the stitches are. I know, L. Riggs, I saw, and Quilty Nancy, I saw little mushrooms too. I saw those little mushrooms. Yeah, they could be like, you know, nuts, like wing nuts or something. Um, mmm. A nun maker, you saw that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The Bayo tapestry. Is it thread or shadow? Okay, okay, let me, let me keep going. Hang on. Oh, I'm, I'm only on image five out of 30. I gotta, I gotta, let's keep, let's keep it pushing here. Hang on. Um, and we can go in to any, wow, to any of these and look more closely, okay? I'll leave that one out, you know, so you can see this whole thing because there's more detail. Okay. About 1400 is what the VNA puts this at. Part of a quilted linen coverlet, probably for a bed with, really, with scenes from the legend of Tristan, outlined with brown and white linen thread in backstitch. With this form of quilting, trapunto, stuffed quilting, Italian, right? Trapunto, French, boutique. The design is brought up into relief where required. The threads of the backing are pulled apart and rolls of cotton are inserted with also some cord quilting. Totally, Sonia. I mean, like, forever it took. I mean, it, it's amazing to me this was like for a bed, like for a princess, perhaps. The linen backing is more loosely woven than the front. We might see the back, I don't know. To allow for this cording, okay? Because you stuff that cord in through the back, which we saw long ago, long ago. We watched some stuff on Boutique. The scenes are not in their original order and have been rearranged. The top has been cut and restitched around the figures. It says in parentheses, two sets of stitch holes are visible. Okay. Um, the top was uh, cut and restitched at a later date. There are six scenes in the center within a border of four leaf clovers. Wow. Okay, and they said they're out of order, but here's what's going on here. The six scenes include the Morald on a horse in a boat with his fleur-de-lis shield shooting with a bow and a page is rowing the boat. These are not, what I'm showing you now and what I'm reading, they, they're not together because there's just like these 30 pictures and then there's this list of stuff and so you just have to kind of let it wash over you, okay? Um, another scene depicts a castle with a king and queen and, an, and another looking out, probably King Languis. Languise, Queen Lotta, L-O-T-T-A, cool, and Isolde, waiting for the more old, the more old. I wanna make sure I don't miss any pictures, okay, I mean, any questions, okay, good, good, good. Um, another scene, Tristan with his three horn shield and Morald with his fleur de lis shield fighting on the aisle. Maybe this is it, this is this one. Look, 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 look. Tristan with his three horns shield, that's it. That's Tristan, that's our guy, that's our man. And Morald, Morald is like got a, he's eaten like, he's eating something while he's fighting. He's like, mm -hmm. um, he's got a fleur de lis shield fighting on the aisle. Wow, wow, oh yeah, look, 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 look. Look, Tristan, look, Trist, right? Right here, Trist, you know? Above the sword in Morald's hand, Trist. You know, oh, and then, do we see Morald? I don't know. I see M-O-O-L-L -L something. Wow, wow. Um, another scene shows a page with a saddled horse. That's it, that's it, that's it. This is all, it's all coming together. Look, it's a page with a saddled horse. What is Elrigs? What are you up to, Elrigs? They think that the, the Bayo, is it Bayo or Bayo? was sewn by women in a convent. It's the same, is it the same with this one? It's a very good question, I don't know. Maybe we will learn. It's interesting, the Wikipedia entry is pretty long, so if for some reason the VNA doesn't tell us what we wanna know, we can look there too. Look at the horse. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. I mean, and this font, 
I'm living for this font. We also have a scene of a ship being pushed away by Tristan's foot, who is in the adjacent scene. Okay, that's not it. Ugh, I, can I just have this coat, please? It looks like a schmata. Like, I would wear it a cool con if I could. Um, Tristan with his horse and shield with three horns. Central scenes are framed by eight border scenes that are placed horizontally to the lower edge. King Mark sitting on a throne in his castle with a hound beside him, receiving the letter from the two kneeling ambassadors. Behind them stands Sir Tristan holding his sword. A ship with a soldier rowing. Uh-huh, maybe this is it. In the raised poop deck are the two ambassadors with a banner I don't know if this is it, with a banner above bearing the fleur de lis and vertically on both sides. Left from the top, a ship with rowing soldiers and a banner bearing the fleur de lis. Yep, okay, I think this is it, because look up here, there's your banner. There's your banner of the fleur de lis. Um, and in the poop deck is a man blowing a boatswain's whistle. Uh, uh, yeah, boats, boatswain? I know it's coxswain. I don't know how to pronounce boatswain. Bootsons with a page sitting below him. It's true. The page is like, I want to row. Tristan giving his glove to Morald, who's in full armor. Mm, wow, so beautiful. It's an hey, Earth Girl now. It's good to see you. I'm so glad you're here. Um, welcome. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's really... Look at this boat. Oh, sorry, sorry. Look at this boat and the fish and the water, I mean, I don't know. It makes me, like I see Boutique and white work and like Trapunto stuff and it's beautiful and it's, I say this with respect, it's fussy AF, you know? It's really, it's like, and, and I just am not a clean person. I mean, I'm a clean person, but I'm not a, I can't do that. I can't, I can't make things with gloves on and if I didn't make white work with gloves on, it would be filthy and pointless and it would really be a drag. But I see stuff like this, like letters and pictures. And I know white work could be pictures, but so often white work is flor florals and it's just gorgeous, tiny stitches and cording and, you know, motifs. But this is a story. It's pictorial. You know, it's just awesome. It's awesome. Um, my, <laughs> Molly, exactly. Molly says, quote, Mine would have Cheeto dust all over it. Same. I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> I couldn't have said it more truthfully. Um, so there's also, there's a couple other scenes, okay? Um, so, okay, so this, this is image 15 out of 30 that they have on the VNA website. And all of this is at the VNA. This whole slideshow is at the VNA and all the information so you can check it out, pardon me. So here's some more stuff. So the following physical details were established by Linda Hillier, sorry, during conservation in 2007, written in answer to questions from an inquirer. Maybe they'll answer our questions. The finishing of the edges. The linen on the face of the object is taken round to the back. They're so British. Taken round to the back, creating a very tiny hem, which is slip stitched to the linen on the back of the object. The hem is about four millimeters deep. Interesting. Someone asked, how many pieces of fabric are there? And Ms. Hillier responds, <clears throat> the central section is made up of two widths, which are joined. Can I do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this might be the back. Yeah, I think it is. Okay. Um, two widths, which are joined with a very fine seam formed by turning back the edges of each width and secured with very fine, tight slip stitching. This is very nerdy tonight, you guys. The loom width of the linen on the face of the object is possibly about 26 and a half inches. The central panel also forms part of the upper and lower borders. Okay, there's a lot more about some construction. I mean, if there's a lot here about joining the central panel and the seams and things, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get to the really good stuff. Oh, well, this is interesting, okay. Uh, the central section and the side panels were certainly worked separately. Let's take a look at that real quick. So, 
this was made in in parts <laughs> yeah cotton and bourbon's like hang on <laughs> we want bender and stuff she says i love that one of the oldest known quilts used a modified quilt facing versus a binding it's, it's exactly it's perfect we can learn so much right all figurative elements so this refers to the thread all figurative elements and all the lettering is worked in brown linen thread the background to the figures and letter and letters is worked in white stitching the background stitching does echo the figures to a large extent wait a minute what oh god yeah oh wait a minute there is is that those are stitches oh my god it is so wait a minute yeah oh wow yeah okay i mean i guess i knew that right it's all stitched it's all stitched like the background is stitched i mean it's quilted i mean that's why it looks so cool right but like i didn't like i just i didn't really process oh robin hi oh girl i mean I'm feeling embarrassed a little bit because like, well, yeah, I mean, are those little dots and puckers and texture, is that, is that quilting in the background? I mean, it's just so much quilting. I thought it was like the fabric or something. Do you see what I'm saying? Let me, let me get closer. I mean, I guess so. It's it's stitching. Like down in here, like look in the crook of his elbow. Those little dots, I guess. I guess you'd, I'm gonna continue. Sometimes I get real, you know, on something and then the next sentence literally is the answer to my question. The background stitching does echo the figures to a large extent. Because the quilt has so many elements, this means that the background stitching is worked in many directions. It can be at a diagonal, horizontal, or vertical to an adjoining figurative element, so it often appears to be random in direction, but on close observation, it has started by echoing a figure. Dear God. This stitching is a simple running stitch. See, thank you, Robin. Yes, yes, exact, that is crazy. Uh, the Cheeto dust, like the quilt would be Cheeto dust. Like if that's the, like the level, look, you can see it over here, you guys. Up here in this, in this corner, you know, like, like I'm looking over here on the, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side. Yeah. I, I don't understand. Like, I, I don't understand this. The lines of stitching are generally about one eighth of an inch apart and there are seven to eight stitches per inch. Yeah, right, right, right. The lines of stitching create a slightly rippled effect, possibly due to the excess of fabric around the quilted areas. Uh, there are no indications of drawing on the linen under the embroidery. This may indicate that the quilt has been washed at some time in its history. Are you kidding me? No, 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 no. Get that away from water. I mean, okay. Well, they had to wash it because it was grubby. I mean, please. The figures in the border scenes are between 40, between 42 and 55 centimeters. The letters are between 3.5 and 4.5 centimeters high. The embroidery goes through both of the layers. Sometimes, I think they did, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Hey, quilting time. Microfill and trapunto, exactly. Um, just a little bit more about this in case you're not blown away yet. Um, I know we are. The embroidery goes through both layers of linen. Um, sometimes not completely. Hang on. Hold on. Not completely, but in general, the outlines of embroidery thread on the reverse of the object mirror those on the face of the object. All figures are stuffed throughout. Susan R. Michael says, I've machine stitched real close and the spaces between the stitches creates a beautiful wave look. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's all happening for this. 
it's all happening for this. The fact that the stitching goes through both layers, this is the VNA lady too, this is sort of the end of, of her answer, Q and A, right? The fact that the stitching goes through both layers indicates that the stuffing could not, oh, sorry, we got a few more pictures here, could not have been introduced through the more loosely woven linen of the back of the object. It seems more likely that the outline of each figure was stuffed as the work was in progress. And when the stuffing was in place, the outline was closed. The details of the figure could then be embroidered. The possible loom width of the linen on the back of the object, which is a coarser weave than that on the face of the object, is about 30 inches wide, or 76 centimeters. By the way, its height is 320 centimeters, and its width is 287 centimeters. I mean, oh wait, there's a little bit more here. There's a little, oh God, oh God, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, the clap for these ladies, yes, yes. Thank you, yes. Um, I mean, here's, here's a little bit more. I gotta tell you a little bit more. There's a lot here, but. <sighs> Historical significance. Hmm, Oof. I mean, Tristan and Isolde are second only to Lancelot and Guinevere as great lovers, as, as great lovers of the Arthurian legends. Although originally the story had nothing to do with King Arthur. The story of their tragic love has been the subject of numerous medieval and modern retellings. The medieval versions of the story are sometimes divided into two branches, called the courtly and the common versions. Love is loftier and more courtly in the courtly version. Um, historical context. There's a related piece in the Bargello Florence, in Bargello Florence, sorry, in the Bargello in Florence, originally thought to come from the same large quilt. Recent research suggests that it is more likely the quilts were made as a pair and subsequently altered. Ten and a half feet. Thank you, Miss Lainey. I was wondering. The Bargello piece acquired in 1927 from Count Paolo Giocardini, Giocardini has got eight scenes and consists of three longitudinal strips. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, there's also been a suggestion the two quilts were assembled out of two wall hangings. Uh, I mean, yeah, there you go. There you go. The Tristan and Isolde quilt. Pretty cool, right? Pretty freaking cool. And what I'm gonna do now that we've seen all these things, just let, the, go to this lady, right? Like it's important to see that I think, because that's how it that's how it is uh, at the V&A. And that's so that's just one piece, and it sounds pretty like it sounds pretty much like they're taking a position on this idea that there's a third section. It sounds like they're like, look, anything can happen, but we're pretty sure that there are these two parts to this quilt. <clears throat> and this third thing that's out there is probably something else. You know? You know? Mm. The Flintster, can you imagine trying to stuff the Tripunto as you go? No. No. And keeping the whole thing straight? No. no. I can't imagine any of this. Okay, so then, check this out. Look at this. Now, I, you know, I, what can I tell you about this? I don't, I don't rightly know much about it. Um... I found one picture of this thing. Hang on. I mean, I really, I really don't know much about it. So I found one picture of this, of this, which is a modern, I know, I'm a modern thing. I mean, someone has made this thing, okay? <laughs> and I found it when I was looking for, before I went to the VNA website and was like, I don't need to pull these pictures down. I'm just going to use the VNA website, like the Ann West coverlet. But as I was hunting down things, I found this. And I was like, oh my god. And so then time ran out. So I was like, OK, well, I'll grab the blog where I found it and see if we can get anything out of this thing. So this is from Diane Herbert. This is not who made this. I know, I know. OK, wait, the first picture I found of this, I clicked on it. And Google was like, you are headed to a bad site. Turn back now. Like, this is, like, <laughs> you know, don't, don't continue. And so I was like, don't gotta tell me twice. So I went back and it was like through Pinterest and it was like Pinterest.fr, you know, like it was super sketch. But then I found this version of it. But I don't know anything else, so let's just see. So Diane Herbert in 2014 had a blog post called the Tristan Boutique Quilt. She named her post the Tristan Boutique Quilt. Check, oh, here we go, here we go. We're on the case, we're on the trail. 
Diane writes, visitors to the 2014 Houston Quilt Festival. Well, now we know where to, we can track this thing down. Saw a remarkable French quilt draped up across a lighted platform. Oh my God, was I there? I might've been there. Yeah, I probably was. Oh, I missed this. A group of more than 40 women OMG, replicated a 14th century quilt using the technique known as booty in France and trapunto in the U.S. Actually, in Italy, but also in the U.K. They hand-stitched the design through two layers of cloth, then stuffed them from the back. You may know the story of the Cornish knight, Tristan, from Wagner's opera, or tales... We got a Wagner, we got a Wagner in the show. Um, or King Arthur tales. Okay, there's similar stories from medieval Brittany. The quilt, this quilt brings them to life with figures that reminded me of the ones in the, the Bayo tapestry. Who was that? Who brought that up? It's too nerdy, it's too nerdy. It's also this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> The backlighting transformed the knights, kings, and ships into silhouette, making it easy to see the designs. It's brilliant. Isn't it brilliant? And easy to appreciate the amount of careful work that went into this masterpiece. What an ingenious way to display this quilt. Um, yes. Yes, it's wonderful. It's absolutely fantastic. So what... Yeah, this is a moment. Yeah. 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 Hey, thanks for following Beverly's, Bu Beverly's Butter. You have to keep coming around. I love saying that. Beverly's Butter. Fraz Noel, it's so good to see you. I didn't say hi to you yet. Yeah, Beverly's Butter, you need to hang out here. So, okay, so for 2014, hang on, because I didn't read it. I didn't read ahead. 2014 Houston Quilt Festival, Tristan Quilt. I mean, I want to put like, light box but i don't know if that's gonna help um interesting oh look my girl meg cox right there meg cox wrote about it she wrote about it she wrote about it on her blog and she says the most breath the single most breathtaking quilt at the houston festival of 2014 she was reporting from that show was the tristan Bouti, a reproduction of a famous quilted bed cover mm-hmm uh, it took oh, it took more than 40 French women about 7,000 hours to make it, and it was beautifully displayed. Well, I mean, I'd like to know who. So it was called the Tristan Boutique. Tristan Boutique. 2014. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. So there you go. Now you know about the Tristan quilt, you know? Um, okay, here's what's going on. So we went from very, very old, I mean, 1400. Look, um, to now we're gonna go, we're gonna speed forward. And I'm not gonna tell you where we're going, but we're gonna go to, we're gonna go to something interesting. And I'm gonna read to you something. I'm gonna read something to you that's gonna be really, really interesting in, 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 in conjunction. So quick, quick break, quick quick, very quick. And then I'll be right back. And then you'll be back and everybody will be back. Okay. Okay. BRB.
You people leave me for donuts. I'll approve. There's a donut making class on Twitch right now. You know what? That's pretty awesome. You know, this, so, so my second little section, my second chapter tonight. Um, if we get done before that donut class is out, we could do our first raid. And I've never done a raid. We've never done a raid. But if you've been here, you were here, you might have been here when, what was it, Wheels... Somebody that we somebody raided our show, you remember? And that's another thing that's so cool about Twitch is that if, if somebody's streaming and they get done with their stream, they can send all of their audience to raid someone else's channel. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And yeah. And so Oh yeah, yo quilt nerds on Instagram. <gasps> Dee Dee Brucker set up a, a an Instagram for um quilt nerd and it's called Yo Quilt Nerd. Like Yo Mary Fonts. So follow Yo Quilt Nerd and Yo Mary Fonts. But if we get done before that donut class is out, we're raiding them. I don't know how to do it though. Wait a minute. Hold on. I gotta get ready now. Oh, there's Tristan. Uh, what's happening? Okay, okay, okay. Well, 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 let's just let's just do this. Let's just do this. But that's what I want to do. Okay. Hey, Sibby Mac. Wait a minute. CB Mac, weren't you here? I'm in favor of a raid too. And the thing is, is if, and then we just all go there and I'll be there too to be like, hey. And what's really cool is that then the donut person will be like, oh my God, like what's going on? And they don't know. And we'll be like, we're the Quiltners. We like donuts too. And they'll be like, Quiltner, what a cool show. And then maybe donut people will come here and then they'll teach us how. But that's what I'm telling you about Twitch. There's lots of cool stuff here. You know, there's a lot of cool stuff to explore. It's not just gamers. It's a lot of gamers, I know, but it's not just gamers. Okay, so it's donuts. Donut quilt crossover. Donut nerd. Doesn't work as well. Nerd is ours. Okay, but but yeah, donut something. Anyway, and now for something completely different. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. I gotta show you something first, okay. So the other day, if, 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 you, if you folks are not members of the American Quilt Study Group, consider it, won't you? I'm a member of the American Quilt Study Group. And the American Quilt Study Group, we should do a whole thing on that. I mean, it's so big, it's like, I don't know. It, so, so the American Quilt Study Group is um, a group of nerds. I mean, they're, they're the original quilt nerds, truly truly, um, AQSG. And just so you know, my mom has been a member of AQSG for a long time. And she took me to the seminar one year. They have a yearly seminar. And, um, oh, wait, it's supposed to say type forward slash raid. Let me just see something here. Hang on, hang on. Forward slash raid. Cool. Yes, that's what I do. I type forward slash raid and then the name of the channel. Okay. Get that ready, get that ready. Hey, oh my God, horrid little Spitfire. Horrid little Spitfire, it's your first time in the chat. I'm so glad that you're here. I, I think, I mean, you might be horrid in your screen name, but I think you're delightful. Okay, let's send some welcome baskets to horrid little Spitfire because you're, 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 it's your first time in the chat. And you say, I might even go on a raid my very first live. Yes, slow typist here, hey. You're in good company, and that would be really fun if your first live, you were like on a raid. Anyway, so the American Quilt Study Group is like the original quilt nerds, and this woman that I just, it sucks, I never got to meet her, Sally Garut, she started the American Quilt Study Group in like, I don't know, 80? Something like that, something like that. And they're just truly the original quilt nerds. And there's a journal. I read out of it a lot, a lot. Remember the, the thing that we did on Sandra Mitchell, uh, that, that, you know, really larger than life personality who was a quilt dealer, you know. You know, I read to you from an, an essay, an, a paper that was published in Uncoverings, the American Quilt Study Group's uh, yearly journal, the research papers. The research papers of the American Quilt Study Group. Uncoverings, okay. And um, yeah, 1981. No, I think so. So I think anyway, the 70s. It's it's been around for a long time. 
So I, my mom just, you know, was like, do you want to come to the American Quilt Study Group seminar? And I had just started quilting, and I was like, yeah, I am super into quilts. And so I met her there. It was in, like, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. It was like, I was so bored. I was not into it. It was before I was ready to be a nerd about quilts. I was just making quilts. I was super excited about it. I was now, like, working in the quilt industry. I'm like, okay. And I wasn't ready. I was like, they, they the whole seminar, like, the keynote address was on, like, indigo. <laughs> like, indigo in chintz fabric in, you know, 1795. And I was like, <laughs> like, I just was not. It was before I was ready. I wasn't. I wasn't ready yet. I wasn't, I was, I was, I hadn't grown, I had not flowered as a nerd. And so just, you know, in case somebody's checking out this show for the first time or they don't think, they don't think it's like for them, I don't know. I think it, once you start really getting a taste for like quilt history and some of this stuff, you might be a nerd and it might, it just might not have flowered yet in you. So, um, so the American Quilt Study Group is really awesome though. And here's the thing, this is the latest issue. Of uncoverings, okay? The research papers. You live near Cherry Hill. Robin, Cherry Hill was lovely, but I didn't get to see any of it because we were at this hotel, like by the airport nearby. I don't know. I was in my hotel room a lot, like probably surfing the internet, you know, like I don't know, shopping or something. But um, um, I feel bad about that now because I would love to go to that now, but at the time it wasn't good. So, so this is the latest issue, okay? Here's what it says on the back. The American Quilt Study Group establishes and promotes the highest standards for interdisciplinary quilt-related studies, providing opportunities for study, research, and publication of works that advance the knowledge of quilts and related subjects. I mean, hell yeah, they're also based, their headquarters, <laughs> a very small little place, um, in Lincoln, Nebraska, where the Quilt Museum is. Now, this is a slender volume. It's quite slender. It's alarmingly slender. Um, now I can't say much because I've never submitted a paper to the American Quilt Study Group yet. I mean, come on, like it's gonna happen, but I haven't yet. <clears throat> and there's really cool stuff in here. But there have been years where the Uncoverings journal was like thick, like looking like a snack thick. And it isn't that way, and it hasn't been that way for a little while. So the reason I say this is, yes, they're very expensive to produce, it's so true. But the reason, and there's there's really nice glossy pages in here, but the number of papers that's published in this is four. So there's four. And I wish there were eight, you know? Like, like I said, it's easy for me to say this because, you know, I, well, I should just, maybe I should stop doing a live stream show and start writing papers for the AQSG journal. But, um, but I, I say it because like, maybe you should. And I get really intimidated by the idea of writing a scholarly paper because this is peer reviewed. You submit your paper and they check it out. And if it's not ready or if it doesn't hold up or whatever, they tell you, sorry, we can't accept it. Here's some feedback or something and you start over. I mean, I have a master's degree in writing, but I, I mean, I didn't like my thesis. I was at art school. Okay. I know I'm not supposed to. I went to art school. Um, so, so it was kind of a different thing. I mean, I didn't like have like a, 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 I didn't have a thesis that I had to like defend exactly. So, so it's a lot, you have to have footnotes and stuff, but like basically, like Molly, <laughs> I'm talking to you, and like lots of, lots of, lots of people. Imposter syndrome, oh girl, Mary Kate. Mary Kate. We have to do this, you know? We have to, we have to do this. We have to start writing for this thing. The quilt nerds who are, because I, I don't know everybody in AQSG, but I am definitely one of the youngest people there. If there are 10 people who are in their 40s, that is amazing. I have not been to a conference in a long time or a seminar, so maybe people are gonna get really offended that I would even suggest that AQSG is growing older and the average age of the AQSG member you know, is, is not 40. Let's put it that way. Okay. So like, 
Molly says, if anybody wants to write something, I'm happy to help out with citations, research, etc. That would be awesome. And 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 the, here's the other thing is they have a grant. They have like a what is it? How do they call it? But they have a um, <laughs> yes, offers research grants, outreach grants, and seminar fellowships. You can apply to have like a mentor. You can, or maybe you can get a mentor. Just go to the American Quilt Study Group website, which is, and and poke around because they will, um, they'll pair you with a member who can help you with your paper. And so, the, so basically, it's like if you want to write about the Bayou Tapestry, or you want to write about. Um, uh, God bless it. Will somebody write about those damn kimonos? Why were all, why were all these like art cultures making kimonos? And were they all like white ladies who were like, I don't know, it's like what's going on? What's what kimono? But like, if something on this show inspires you or makes you go, God, I love this topic. Like, I want to know more about that thing. People who make these research papers are not different. They just spend time figuring it out, and then you talk to yeah, Molly. Send it to me, I'll read whatever you want. You don't have to have letters behind your name or in front of your name to do a research paper. And it doesn't have to be really long either. Just, but think about it. Because if if people don't write papers, there will be four research papers published. And then there will be three. And then someone will be like, I don't know if we should print this with three. <laughs> Maybe we should just do a PDF, you know? And then like uncoverings suddenly isn't a thing. I mean, I, I just can't let that happen. We can't let Quilter's newsletter and like uncoverings go away. So again, maybe I should put my money where my mouth is and do a paper. I'm working on it. This whole Bertha Mextroff thing, you know, it's the same kind of thing. And 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 so I think I've made my point, but I, but I just like, if you're watching the show and you're really into it, just put it back in your mind of like, what would I love to know more about? Like, what would I like to write about? And the last thing is, and Mary Kate's out there too, an editor, an experienced editor. I have gotten writing from, how do I put this carefully? I have gotten writing from people who have been published many times. Uh, I've gotten drafts from them. Uh, first drafts, and I have been surprised, surprised at like just how much, how awesome they were by the time they were published. Let's put it that way. You do not have to be Joan Didion. You do not have to be, you don't have to worry about like if you're writing like beautiful prose, like write the truth about a thing. And then believe me, your editors will delight in making it the best it can be. So don't get hung up on like whether you're, you're a good writer or not. Just like investigate and put it down on paper. And then just, God, email me, please. I will hook you up with anybody who you could possibly imagine you'd want to talk to. I mean, I got the connections, man. I got the connections. So that's all. That's all. Think about it. Okay? Think about it. Um, exactly. Yes, exactly. The Flintster. They, that's what, the, you know, they publish it every other year. Right. So suddenly uh, uncoverings is a bi, you know, biannual, right? It's just a drag because we see how much stuff there is to, to, to see. And then the other thing is, then nobody's around to edit it. And they're like, oh, I can't do it. You know, I'm sorry. I can't edit. And so then they're like, we don't have an editor this year. So we just got to do it next year. I hope. Now I'm really depressed. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you. So this quote behind me. I'm the wordsmith. Well, I love to write, man. I've been writing a long time. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, Molly, exactly. So, um, <laughs> being on Twitch. Hey, hey, you know what? There you go. Padma says, somebody write an article about Mary being on Twitch and put it in a quilt magazine. Talk about the whole quilt nerd phenomena. You know what? You know that whole Iowa radio thing? The reason they were interested in talking to me is because quilting was in the Twitch world. Like, how crazy is that? Like, quilting in the 21st century on a live streaming platform? Like, okay, that is interesting. Not just this, but like, what has the internet done to quilting? Not, if people have written about the internet a little bit, but not enough, please write about the internet. But like, how, how did the, mo we're gonna look at modern quilts from 2018. 
right now. How, how did the internet, how did it make the modern quilt guild what it is? I mean, it, you get real granular like that. It's like the modern quilt guild started in like 2009, 2010 in LA. Just talk to Elisa Hate Carlton and be like, what was your internet life like? Like, were you posting pictures on like Flickr? Or what? And then you talk to Latifah Safir and she's like, yeah, I was doing that or I was using Pinterest or something. I mean, like you just go along the trail and then you find out how the internet affected the modern quilt guild and how it like grew, that kind of thing. Okay, so here's what's going on. Not your, don't you say that? Don't you, I'm not even gonna read that. All right, so here's my idea. This is an Uncoverings from 1981. And volume two, wow, yeah, 1980, okay, right. Volume two of the research papers of the American Quilt Study Group, edited by Sally Garut. And this isn't very long, but it was two years old. But look, here's the thing that's really interesting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. With two special presentations, there's eight pieces in here. There's four pieces in the one that just came out, and there's eight. And I think we, we read something from this before, remember? It was a really cool episode. I forget what it was we read. But something that happened over the years, I think that they've gotten the, the, the maybe more academics were writing for this. And by academics, I mean like, you know, working in the academia system. And I think it did get kind of like, here he is, American Quilt Study Group. But in the beginning, it was a little looser in terms of like, I don't know. I just, if I was the editor, I would want like really solid stuff, of course, really good stuff. But I like how the early days, it wasn't all about like, you better have foot, you better come hard with your footnotes or don't even like, don't even send it. So I'm gonna read to you something in 1981. I remember we read something. Okay, so this is called The Contemporary American Quilter, a portrait. Okay, it's not very long. Yep, but while I read it to you, I am going to read, I'm going to go through winners from 2018 QuiltCon. Now, I've named, I did all the names of the quilts and the makers of, this is the best in show from 2018. I'll tell you why 2018 in a second. This is Stephanie Scardell, Scardall. It's called Going Up. This quilt is called Going Up, and it won Best in Show in 2018. I, I labeled all the dates on these quilts as 2018, although I realize that may not be the case, but they didn't have dates on them, and I was like, <laughs> I have to do something that groups all these together for my brain. Um, so, and the reason it's 2018 is I was like, I gotta talk more about modern quilters, and we went so old with the Tristan and Isolde quilt that I was like, well, let's do something really contemporary and I asked Eric, I was like, give me, give me a year between 2013 and 2021. And he was like, 2018. I was like, okay, let's do it. And the winners of 2018, it, it was a great year. I mean, it's just, it's just always good year. So I'm just going to, it's a little slideshow while I read you this. Some eye candy, some meditation. And the other, the other idea here is that this was published in, this is the most important part. This was published in 1981. So I'm gonna overlay this portrait of a quilter, an American quilter from 1981 on these quilts from 2018. And we'll figure out what that says. Like, does it, is it exactly the same? What are the parallels? What's different? I think it'll be interesting, okay? Okay, let me see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 the, the journal itself will have guidelines for submission doesn't have to be 30 pages. It doesn't have to be 20 pages. Okay. okay, The Contemporary American Quilter, A Portrait by Marilyn Davis. This paper is based on a survey of quilters from around the United States, all kinds of quilters, from beginners who have just completed one quilt to those who have been quilting for over 30 years. Many respondents to this survey are famous in the quilt world. They are authors, teachers, and artists. Completed a year ago, you can do a survey, by the way. Completed a year ago, the survey was not taken with the intention of presenting a research paper. 
Instead, as a somewhat frustrated anthropologist who happens to own a fabric store, <laughs> awesome, I wanted to find out who these people are who are buying all the fabric. What do they do with it? Why is it so important to them? You'll see that this is not really a market survey. I didn't ask what their income is, where they live, their husband's occupation, or if they were self-supporting. I wasn't particularly interested in knowing what they would buy the most of, but I have an incurable desire to know more about the people in the world I live and work in. I consider myself first an anthropologist, then a businesswoman, and this survey is a reflection of that. This quilt is by Anne Sullivan. It's called Reflection. I have used the survey technique extensively in my work because although it doesn't always give the complete picture or sometimes not even the correct picture, it is great for evaluating hypotheses and turning up ideas and issues that may not have otherwise been considered. A survey often has problems in getting respondents, but this survey was the most unusual I've ever done in that I gave out 100 surveys and received 129 back. People took the survey home, Xeroxed it, there's a difference, um, and passed it on to their quilting friends. Think how easy it is to pass on a survey now, right? Um, because of this, I had several false starts in the analysis. I would be in the middle of tabulation and in would come another half dozen surveys. I reread my survey over and over, trying to discover what there was about it that made the respondents want to fill it out because that discovery would be truly marketable. I've come to the conclusion that it must be the quilters themselves. Their inherent need to make a statement, to be heard, to give something that tells them, tells about their lives and who they are. This is Colleen McFarland, Finding Home. Because I have good access to the quilters of California, most of the respondents are from the West Coast. However, since it was also distributed at the AQSG seminar and Houston Quilt Market, it includes respondents from almost every state. Who are these quilters? Well, they are all women. This may not be quite true, but Michael James and Jeffrey Gutchen aside, we know these names, do we not? Both of them have been featured on Quilt Nerd. Those dudes aside, there are very few men who are quilting today. So our quilt maker is a woman, most likely to be about 43 years of age. We had no respondents under 20 years old. I mean, not a lot has changed, y'all. It's interesting. Uh, not that it should have changed, but it's just, I mean, that's about right, isn't it? Okay. We had no respondents under 20 and only 4% under 25. So it appears that, and this correlates with the reasons women gave for quilting on the survey, the desire to quilt has a direct relationship to giving something of yourself to the people you love, most likely your family and children, to establishing a household, traditions, and a future, all things most women today do after 25. This idea is validated by the fact that 77% of our quilters are married, only 9% divorced. Well, divorce went in the 80s. <laughs> Broken home. Uh, I mean, yeah, okay. Uh, statistically substantially different. Sorry, let me start over and not comment. 77% of our quilters are married, only 9% divorced. Statistically substantially different from the general population, which is approximately 69.2% married and 20% divorced. Interesting. I know, right? I know, Molly. It is weird. There were 14% who were either single or widowed. Very interesting. 72% of these women have children. The majority have two, but a couple of respondents had six or seven children. So far, 77, this is by Daisy Auschaug. Aus I don't know if I say her name, I butchered that. I need to understand how to say her name. Uh, this is called Circle, S-I-R-K-E-L. That's awesome, Circle. Um, the survey confirmed exactly what I thought. Most quilters are housewives who make quilts for their children and families. This is 1981. Is it different now? I don't know. After all, they're the one, you know, that you could do. You could do this, oh God. You could do this survey again. 40 years later, how, does, how has it changed? 
there you go. There's your format. Um, oh, Estelle is out to get you, Molly. Okay. Here we go. After all, they are the ones who have time. Housewives are the ones who have time, she's saying. They make their Christmas and birthday gifts as well. Probably they have more time than money. I used to be in that situation myself so I could understand it. But lo and behold, when all the figures were in, the housewives theory fell by the wayside. Only 22% turned out to be solely housewives. Interesting. And 78% were either professionals, working, or students. In fact, there were more women working in professions, 32%, than in housewives. Than housewives. Needless to say, um, by the way, there's more data and then there's some kind of analysis. Um, there were more women working in professions, 32%, than housewives. Needless to say, with this information, I lost my standard excuse for not getting my latest quilt completed. The profession that comprised the majority of women with 14% was teaching. This is Debbie Grifka, Canterbury number two. Um, nursing came next. Both are occupations that require giving of oneself to others, occupations that suffer the phenomenon that has come to be known as burnout. The survey doesn't account for the role quilting plays in relation to the demands of these professions, but there is a strong indication that women quilt for relaxation, and in this sense may be a response to it may be a response to the pressures on teachers and nurses. We've got a few teachers and a few nurses in this room. Other occupations represented doctors. Uh, other occupations represented included doctors, lawyers, scientists. This is called Urban Trek by Heather Black. Musicians, artists, bureaucrats, investors, writers, and even a masseuse and a bartender. Hmm. Um, how did we get started quilting? Most of us, 42%, took classes and learned to quilt, but almost as many, 37%, taught themselves. Very interesting. Although there are some 8% who have been quilting for 30 years or more, most of us began to quilt at age 31 and have been quilting for seven years or less. Wait a minute. In 1981, the majority of the people she asked that took this survey started quilting at age 31. 31? That's really young. I mean, 31? Was that the average age of the modern quilter? The modern quilt killed quilter when they started? Was it 31? Might have been. Very interesting. It's just numbers. It's just numbers. You can figure it out. Um, as for learning to quilt at mother's or grandmother's knee, only 19% of us learn to quilt from a relative or friend. There's a reason for that. 29% of us have no relatives who quilt. And although 44% of our grandmothers quilted, only about 29% of our mothers quilted. I bet that's less, less for us in, you know, um, like on the border between millennial and Gen X, whatever. Okay, why weren't these skills passed on? This is Heidi Parks, by the way. Why weren't these skills passed on as they had been from previous generations? In my work, I found that these skills were identified with being unable to afford store-bought bed coverings and clothing. Many of us were raised by a generation of mothers who hoped to educate their daughters so that they would have husbands and incomes that would free them from the need to sew. In a sense, they were successful because no one mentioned that they sewed or quilted to save money. Yet our mothers were unaware of an even more basic need that sewing, quilting, and handwork fulfill. Jennifer Emery here. The view that comes down to us is that quilting has traditionally been a social experience. This is Karen Maple Black brown and white in orange. The image of the quilting bee is not so meaningful for those of us who quilt today, but it is still the image that non-quilters have. Recently, a special reporter for a television news program called my store and wanted to do a feature on quilting. Bonnie started quilting when she was 23. Yep, self-care, Myra, totally. Um, so this reporter wanted to do a feature uh, on quilting at my store. She asked if I thought there had been a renewed interest in quilting. I love this quilt. I think it's great. Kathy Thorncraft. I responded with the membership of our local guild and the number of quilt shops in this area. She wanted to come to the store and film, and her question was, when can we come and find a quilting bee in progress? <laughs> 
That isn't to say we don't quilt in groups, because we do make group quilts and raffles and gifts. Did we not start with a group quilt at the top of the show? We did. Weird, 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 weird. Um, but 66% of today's quilters quilt alone most of the time. I mean, I honestly think it's more than that. 66% of quilters in 1981 said they sew alone. I think, I think it's higher today. Yeah. Kenny. Kenny started making quilts when you were 46. First time chat. First time chat from Kenny. I gotta give you a welcome basket. Welcome basket. Everybody gets one when they're first, first time in the chat. Um, welcome, by the way. I'm so glad you're here. Kenny. We need more guys. We need more guys in the room. You gotta represent. Okay. Um, as it turns out, many, 64%, belong to groups or have friends who quilt, but most often when these groups meet, it's more for advice, ideas, and encouragement, and the quilting that takes place is secondary. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, yep. Most quilters prefer to quilt in the evening, watching television, watching Quilt Nerd. This is Leslie Tucker Jennison, by the way. She was an intro quilt for us. Um, some listen to music or talk with their families or watch Quilt Nerd on Twitch with Mary Fonz. What? 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 Although most of us quilt in irregular spurts, we find a dogged 23% who quilt every day. Once you get hooked, this is by Liz Havertine, once you get hooked, it tends to become part of your life. As one woman said, quote, I'm so anxious to devote more time to creative things that I've decided to quit work in June. I started to study music two years ago, and I want to be able to quilt and sing full time. Unquote. Cool. Only 6% of those who quilt said they rarely quilted, and only 3% said that it was of little importance in their lives. Well, yeah. Now, with a faster pace of life, <laughs> <coughs> relatively speaking, it was a faster pace of life in 1981. Um, with the faster pace of life and our careers and jobs outside the home, we may not have the time our grandmothers had to quilt. And in California, we don't have those long, cold winters that are so conducive to quilt making. Nevertheless, we are certainly productive. The average total number of quilts made by each respondent was nine, and that's not all. We made an average of 24 other projects, ranging from pillows to wall hangings, using every conceivable quilting technique, including hand piecing, machine piecing, so on. We employ a combination of techniques that reflect the time pressure we're under and our desire for beautiful quilts. Interesting. It's always about time, you know? Piecing by machine for speed, but not compromising the integrity of the quilt in favor of time, in that most quilts are still hand quilted. Really? In 1981, most quilts are still hand quilted. Remember, it was like 1986 that Carol Fallert won for machine quilting, you know? Yep, yep, exactly. I, exactly, exactly. Um, and listen to this, this is crazy. Interestingly, although more women machine piece their quilts, more prefer hand piecing. Although more women machine piece their quilts, more prefer hand piecing. Interesting, so they're like, I do piece by machine, but I'd rather do it by hand. Wow, that's gotta be different now. I mean, are you kidding? I don't know many. Listen, I'm gonna probably wear that to QuiltCon. All those sneakers and shoulder pads you're talking about. Um, 36% versus 30%. That's really interesting. Okay, most women, uh, the technique most women like doing is hand quilting. As noted earlier, the number of respondents were well known, a number of our respondents, a number of the respondents were well known or professional quilters. Those who earned any money quilting, teaching, or writing only comprised about 28%. This is by Sarah Bond, by the way, ribbon quilt. It's beautiful. I think this percentage in the general population of quilters may be high because of the survey uh, gathered, the surveys gathered in Houston, where there was a high percentage of professional quilters. Um, one respondent wrote, I plan, quote, I plan to quit teaching in a year or two and want to expand my quilting. I hope to earn a small income in this area. Unquote. There are a number of respondents who express their desire to earn a living with their craft. For those who did earn money, I mean, you have to think, this is 1981. I mean, the quilt industry, there was Houston quilt market, but like, it's really interesting in context. Like what was, there just wasn't like the, it's just, it's just a, it was a very different time 40 years ago. Um, for those who, uh, those who did earn money, it was, um, it was um, about equally divided between quilt making and teaching. Um, 
some 6% earned money writing about quilt making, but all in all, I wouldn't recommend that anyone up and quit her job yet. The average amount of money earned by those who quilt, teach, or write was $2,197 in their best year. $2,197 earned by those who quilt, teach, or write. Only two respondents earned $10,000 or more, with the top figure being $12,000. But in the end, why do women quilt? I love this quilt. This is by Tara Knoll. Why do we in this day and age, when time is money, and is that such a premium? When we as women are not only housewives and mothers, but career women as well, feel such a need to tediously cut apart and put back together little scraps of fabric into intricate, complicated patterns, then hold it together with tiny, equally intricate stitches. The reasons people gave are rich, varied, and colorful as our quilt patterns. For example, one woman began quilting after a major weight loss with the leftovers cut out from her seams. That's, that's awesome. There were a myriad, reason, myriad reasons given, but over and over, themes repeat themselves. By far, the most popular reason was relaxation. This is particularly interesting to me because whenever we have a quilt with an obvious amount of work hanging in the store, women who don't quilt say, how could anyone have such patience? What they don't know is that for many women, quilting is the time to relax and forget their worries. Women, woman after woman mentioned the therapeutic and meditative aspect of quilting. Um, they said it was their mantra. They said it was their mundala. I got that right. I got that word right because someone taught me on Quilt Nerd. Mundala. They talked about having personal time, time to withdraw from the busy world, time to think. Another theme was, quilt, was quilting as a means of creative expression. Over half the women talked uh, about it as their reason for quilt, quilting, described it as a tantalizing, achievable goal. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, there's just a little bit left. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make myself big, okay? Because that's the end of the quilts, but I just wanna, I wanna, let's finish this up. This is, this is a really interesting stuff. I mean, it's all interesting to me, but, okay. Um, one woman wrote, quote, I have written a master's thesis and I'm considered a competent secretary. But there's a lot going on there, but my quilting seems to me to be my most significant talent. Oh. Unquote. Many said that <clears throat> they quilt as an expression of love or friendship. At the Oakland M Museum show in 1981, we saw quilts as markers in, lives, in, in, life's, in li live events. Um, so we too use quilts as gifts, journals, and records of marriages, births, and deaths. One woman said, my interest in quilting began with a desire to make a quilt commemorating my wedding and heritage. Another quote, I see quilts as a permanent statement that may survive me. That was the reason for my daughter's quilt, to, to say, I welcome you to the world. <laughs> it's really, it's just really nice. Or I have made, another person said, or I have made quilts for both my sons. My youngest is six weeks, and the first thing I did was to design a quilt for him so that he would always know how much we love him. One of the most touching quilts at the Oakland Museum show was the quilt made for Eli Lilly by his relatives during his final illness. Today, we still make quilts as an act of mourning. In the film Quilts in Women's Lives, Radka Donnell, we know Radka, was commissioned to make a quilt from the clothes of a young girl who had died. One of the respondents to our survey enclosed a slide of the quilt she made entitled White Light. She said, quote, this was made just after my youngest brother was killed in a plane crash. A very sad event in my life, and this quilt reflects my feelings. Also, making this quilt gave me much solace at the time." Quote. Other themes include the balance to quilt making, the excitement of choosing fabrics and colors, the calm, soothing part of quilting, and the satisfaction as the design emerges. One senior citizen said the decision, decision making keeps her mind active. No more yo-yo dieting. Uh, then there's the challenge and sense of accomplishment, the social aspects, friends, community, and support. So many reasons. There are new reasons, too, for quilting. Reasons our grandmothers didn't have. Many respondents, even though our average age is 43, said they saw quilting as a part of the women's movement. There it is. A feminist art form. There it is. Question. If you had another survey, you know, at Houston, 
and you ask this question, you know, what would that be? What would you get on that answer about the, you know, women's movement or like feminism and stuff? We saw one of those quilts in 2018, the Nevertheless She Persisted. I mean, I did a whole lecture on quilts and feminism and I did do a survey about quilts and feminism. I should bring that up. We should talk about that sometime. But I mean, it's really, it's, that, I mean, I, that's fascinating, right? Like how many women would say, anyway, times have changed. The most eloquent response, there's just a little bit left. The most eloquent responses express the tide of the past, continuity of life, and a sense of history. I like the permanence of a quilt, this woman said, sorry. When you work as a secretary, nothing you do has lasting value, unquote. Another woman said, quilt making ties me to my beloved grandmother. I've slept under the quilt she made for me since I was 16. Man. Another responded, quilts are an expression of the ways women have endured by creating something from nothing, making the practical beautiful, making the necessary enjoyable. For me, quilting is a way of tying generations together. For another, I am continuing a rich heritage. And, and you are, and we are. Another, when I am through, this will give me four quilts, one for each of my children. It's no comparison to real quilters, but they will express love and help to form the bridge between generations. Family possession serves to bring a continuity to life, unquote. She totally like has imposter syndrome, right, in that sentence. Um, many said the overwhelming desire to quilt and their satisfaction was something they couldn't explain. I think there's something more. A number of respondents touch on it. One mentioned, quote, the bond between women and the woven fiber. Another suggests that quilting is, quote, a rich magic craft akin to making tools and boats. Fuck yeah, God, I love that. I would love to give an anthropologic view in closing. The evolution of the human species, uh-oh, is distinguished by three crucial events that took place over two million years ago. The first was when the ancestor of humankind put her feet on the ground and walked in an upright position it was so her, right? She's like, I need to get over there and I'm not going to wait for some, well, I'm not going to do it, so I'm going to do it, so I'm just going <laughs> to, you know. Um, this then left her hands free, free to develop an opposing thumb that eventually not only enabled humans to make tools, but to develop an extraordinary control and the ability to manipulate the material world. Love to her. Thirdly, these factors combine with the development of a human brain capable to abstract thought and the ability to dream, imagine, and envision a future. These changes that occurred over two million years ago, two million years ago, are the features that differentiate, differentiated us from other animals. They have evolved through all this time. These uniquely human traits have formed in us a deep love and need to create with our minds and hands. We see evidence of this deep need in every culture, in an American Indian weaving a basket, the bold and intricate body painting from an African tribe, a virtuoso violinist, a clay pot from a Mexican woman's hands, and, and a quilt from a contemporary American quilter. You know, wasn't a footnote in sight, by the way. You know, so the uncoverings, the, you know, in the past years, it's up to the editor, you know. So anyway, that was good, wasn't it? I've never read it. I mean, I, I don't do that. I don't do that. Might get us into trouble sometimes, but I, I love reading it with you, you know. It was pretty great. It, you know, it was data heavy at the top, but that's interesting. But I liked, I liked that a lot, you know, about evolution. And I don't know. It's like we got to do it. We got to make things, and we want to make things, and it's in us to do it. And for all those reasons those women said, you know, just like I got to relax. I got to do something for myself because I give all the time, you know to the people that I love and to the things that I love, but I gotta have something for myself and, and quilts are just freaking awesome for that, you know? And then you have a quilt at the end of it. That's always what I like to say. Anyway, this is my favorite thing to do. Um, you're starting it in your family, Myra, that's good. The first one quilting in your family, going back to your great grandmother for both on both sides. 
I'm a second generation quilt maker, you know? It doesn't go that far in my family either. But we're all here now. That was a good, that was a, that was good. That was good, thank you. Um, Marilyn Davis, 1981. Awesome. Everyone, I hope you have a lovely evening. It's 10, 16, and I thought it'd be like a shorter show. It never is, never. Sometimes it might be. Sometimes it might be, and you can't, you know, don't be sad if I'm like, I only have an hour, but anyway. A great, a great, a great night, I think. Okay. Well, I'll see you all on Tuesday. I'm get, I made such progress on my video. I really want to finish it tomorrow, so I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to work. I'm just going to work really hard and try to get it done. And uh, that's it. I'll see you Tuesday evening, and have a wonderful day, and, and be safe, and, and work on something, you know? And think about what you'd write if you were going to write a paper. On, on If you were going to put on your quilt nerd cap and get as nerdy as you wanted to get, what would you do? You know? Okay. Bye. <laughs>